Hi, this is the second part to the video covering an implementation of an efficient MIPS TLB for the VR4300 and R5900 processors. Recall the TLB architecture that we ended with in the previous video. Here we have the VR4300's Joint Data and Instruction TLB connected to the TLB refill bus and the Data Virtual Address port, while the R5900's JTLB is only connected to the refill bus. We will consider both architectures here, but we will end up settling on using the R5900's TLB architecture for both processors. Before we begin, I would like to briefly mention coherence algorithms for these architectures. What do we do when the OS writes a new entry to the JTLB, and how do we update the micro-TLBs? I couldn't find any specifics in either datasheet, so we have two choices. We can either implement a flush-on-write coherence algorithm, or figure out some way to deal with writes. Considering that using a refill bus will require some form of sequencing, we might want to avoid adding additional sequencing and delays associated with the JTLB write. So the simplest solution is to implement a flush on write coherency algorithm, which effectively empties the micro TLBs every time the JTLB is written. That will be inefficient, especially if the virtual address of the new entry was not resident in the micro TLBs, resulting in the worst case of six consecutive micro TLB misses for the dual micro TLB architecture. Additionally, I want to mention that this video will not be presented in the most logical order, but instead in the order in which I developed and optimized the implementation. So think of this video as more of a sketch of the engineering process behind the final result. With that note out of the way, let's begin by looking at how to implement the translation process for each entry in the JTLB. The first thing we can look at is the hit detection algorithm for the MIPS TLB. Here is an implementation for a general TLB line with a global flag, ASID, and the variable length page. Here the ASIDs are compared or the global bit is checked. Additionally, virtual addresses and the virtual page number is masked to deal with the variable page size. A mask lookup table is used to determine which bit of the virtual address should be used to select the even or odd page. This hit detection block will be common to all of the implementations, however the micro TLB implementation will not have the variable page length, since each micro TLB page will be fixed to 4 kilobyte pages. Additionally, note that this hit detection system will be needed for every active line and therefore will be duplicated many times. Furthermore, note that the output only needs to be masked with an AND gate for the large OR gate implementation. For other implementations, such as using a multiplexer, the final AND gate can be omitted. As an aside, the final implementation will use a similar design. However, the page frame number is not needed and the entry index can be masked instead. Masking the entry index and combining it in an OR gate is a more efficient way to implement a large input one-hot decoder, in this case large being upwards of 48 inputs. One way to combine the multiple lines in parallel is to use a large OR gate, requiring each line to have an AND mask to prevent output collisions, i.e. combining of more than one line. In this example, a collision detection circuit is shown using an n-bit XNOR gate, which will be true if more than one hit flag is active, and if no hit flags are active. Also note that the index of each line can be masked and ORed in the same way to provide feedback as to which line has had a hit, or which line has had a successful probe. Alternatively, the AND OR gate combination could be replaced by a large multiplexer with an added one-hot encoder on the hit flag to select the correct line. Such an implementation may provide better performance since the synthesizer could instantiate a tree of multiplexers instead of using logic units. However, a 32 or 48 input multiplexer using a 32 or 48 bit one-hot encoder will not be particularly fast and most likely the OR gate representation will be more efficient. For smaller micro TLBs, however, the two or four input multiplexers will most likely be more efficient in using the OR gate implementation. Here's a quick first attempt using the same devices as in the combined register file video, the Altera Cyclone 5E and the Xilinx Arctic 7. Unlike in the combined register file video, however, the test setup uses the same clock for all the components, and an equality check is added to the output path. This equality check is to represent the cache tag check required directly after the TLB access in both the data and instruction TLB cases. In these test cases, we are considering a single port joint TLB, which is not the final structure, but help to inform further optimizations and designs. 
One thing that is different about the result table compared to the register file is that there are now slow and fast model clock frequencies for the Arctic 7. It turns out that Vivado does output fast and slow models, however, they have to be selected individually in a non-intuitive way. With that said, let's see how the TLB file did using the AND-OR mask implementation. These results are pretty much what one would expect, considering using the AND-OR gate combination relies heavily on logic. We can also note that the Arctic 7 implementations have higher slow and fast clock speeds than the Cyclone 5 implementations, which is no surprise considering the results from the previous register optimization video. Unfortunately, however, neither 48 entry TLB is fast enough for the PlayStation 2's R5900 processor at 295 MHz, so we will need to consider other implementation options. Let's take a step back and look at optimizing the 2 and 4 entry micro TLBs. To do this, I decided to do a comparison between using the big OR gate and using a selection MUX, since the numbers 2 and 4 are relatively small. We can note that here the selection implementation for the 2 entry micro TLB is significantly faster than the 2 entry micro TLB using the OR gate. Interestingly, the same is not true for the 4 entry micro TLB. However, the selection implementation uses half the LEU resources, which is not insignificant. Also keep in mind that these results are using the default synthesizer settings, and most likely each result can be improved. With that said, it appears that using the LU selection architecture will provide better overall speed and resource usage, so let's go with that design. That only leaves us with the large full TLB to implement more carefully. Since the structure that we were looking to create used a 48 entry JTLB with two micro TLBs for data and instructions, we can start to use that structure to modify the subcomponent design. Recall that the micro TLBs were 2 and 4 entries in size and were connected to the main joint TLB via a refill bus. So whenever a miss occurred in one of the micro TLBs, the processor would stall while the JTLB was searched for a matching entry. This allowed for each JTLB to only have one read port, greatly simplifying the hardware. If we implement an architecture like this, we can then abstract away the actual behavior of the JTLB in favor of optimizing the micro TLBs, which we have already partly done in the previous slide. So one option that we have is to implement the JTLB as a fully associative TLB, which will take up several thousand logic units. An alternative is to look at what was done by Alexander Osman and his AO R3000 core, which is to use a group of block RAMs. Here, four block RAMs are used, each containing one quarter of the TLB entries. They each connect to their own hit tester for comparing entries from the micro TLBs as well as probe detection logic for the TLB probe instruction. Then the appropriate output is selected based on which block RAM had a hit. I should note here that the design I'm showing is loosely based on the AO R3000 cores TLB. I only briefly looked at the general architecture used by the AO R3000 core and not specifically how it was implemented. Additionally note that we could use any power of 2 for the block RAMs and hit testers, where the AO R3000 core used 4 block RAMs with 2 read ports each, having a total of 8 hit testers. However, we obtain a better resource and increased latency trade-off with 4 hit testing units and simplified block RAM read-write hardware by providing each with a dedicated read port. We can immediately see that the total resource usage is going to be significantly reduced in this case by reducing the hit logic from 32 or 48 entries down to 4 and by storing the TLB lines in block RAMs, most likely resulting in a higher overall clock speed. The only issue here is the added complexity in the form of a probe and refill state machine. Since the entries are stored in four block RAMs, we can only access them four at a time, meaning that in the worst case scenario, we will need to walk through the entire TLB file to compare each entry with the value we are looking for. This is true for both micro TLB misses and TLB probe instructions, and since that is a multi-cycle operation, we will have a non-trivial state machine as well as a counter to keep track of the current multiple of 4 we are looking at. Here's the state machine that I came up with. We start in the idle state, which makes a state machine capable of responding to misses as well as probes, reads, and writes. Writes can be handled separately, since only the system coprocessor will be writing to the JTLB. Similarly, since reads are done by a specific entry index and we are using block RAMs, the reads are trivial and can be allowed in the idle state. The two big cases that we have to use the state machine for is the probe instruction and a micro TLB miss. In the probe case, we enter into the probe state and cycle through each group of four entries every clock cycle. If we don't have a probe success, we keep on going until we reach the last entry and return a probe failure. 
if we have a probe success before the last set of four, then we can return early. Probe is a simpler case since it only needs to tell the system coprocessor that the result is ready to be latched into the CP0 register file. On the other hand, we have the miss states, which are similar to the probe state. If the ITLB or the DTLB miss, we enter the miss walk state, going through each set of four until we get a hit or we reach the last entry. If we reach the last entry and don't find a match, then we raise a TLB miss exception for the exception handler to deal with. If on the other hand we find a match, then we enter the miss write back state. This sequences a write on the TLB refill bus to the appropriate micro TLB. It should be noted that if both the instruction and the data TLB misses, the instruction TLB should take priority. The reason for this has to do with how the pipeline behaves during an exception and is a topic for another video. With that said, we should note the operation latencies. If we had a full JTLB like the MIPS architecture specifies, we would only result in a three cycle penalty for a micro TLB miss. One cycle for the check, one cycle to check for the new entry, and one cycle to write the new entry. Probe instructions only require one cycle, since the probe behavior only requires a single cycle, i.e. to look up an entry. For the BRAM TLB, however, a miss or probe would result in an N over 4 plus 1 or 2 cycle penalty for a probe and miss, respectively, where N is the number of TLB entries. This is because we can only check 4 entries at a given time. So a miss on a 32 entry TLB would result in a 10 cycle penalty, and a miss on a 48 entry TLB would result in a 14 cycle penalty. Since the N64 rarely use the TLB, I am not too concerned about the 10 cycle penalty. However, I am concerned with the 14 cycle penalty for the PS2. It is possible that the penalty would not be noticeable though, since 14 cycles at 300 megahertz is 46 nanoseconds. There are a few further simplifications that can be made. The micro TLBs are four kilobyte page subsets of the joint TLB. This is because the smallest page size specified by the architecture is four kilobytes. This ensures that any entry in the micro TLB will always have a corresponding entry in the JTLB and further simplifies the hardware. Since the micro TLB uses four kilobyte page subsets, the original page can be various different sizes and the micro TLBs do not use the even odd mapping. This means that for every entry in the micro TLB, there are effectively two entries in the JTLB. This once again further simplifies the hardware and effectively breaks the translation process into two cycles, one during the micro TLB refill and one during the actual micro TLB access. Since the JTLB is not directly connected to the processor data path, does not need to do any address translations. This means that we only need to implement the probe and hit detection functionality needed by the system coprocessor zero and the refill bus. We can use a flush on TLB write coherency algorithm, which means that we don't have to search the micro TLBs every time a new entry is written, at the cost of introducing additional micro TLB refill penalties. We can implement a pseudo least recently used replacement algorithm for the micro TLBs, which should select an entry in the micro TLB to be replaced upon a micro TLB miss. And finally, the process to convert the variable size page to a four kilobyte page can be abstracted away into another component, which gives the synthesizer and fitter more flexibility when it comes to meeting timing requirements. With that said, let's see how the BRAM implementation does in terms of resources and speed. Due to the increased signal count associated with the refill bus, the joint TLB architectures listed here contain both the joint TLB and the two micro TLBs so that they could be synthesized and tested on their respective devices. These are denoted by the J plus M cases. Additionally, the LU or cases here are using a reduced implementation when compared to the previous slide, which is why we see a significant frequency speed up. I also added another column which shows the micro TLB miss penalty for each of the implementations. The first thing we can notice is that overall, the Cyclone 5 did worse than the Arctic 7 in resource usage and in clock speeds. Additionally, the BRAM JTLB implementations used significantly fewer logic units and for the most part resulted in higher clock speeds when compared to the OR gate versions. Unfortunately, the BRAM implementation is too slow to be used in the PlayStation 2. However, since those were the default results, we should see if we can improve the implementation by adding optimizations. I focus on optimizing the 48 entry JTLB since that's the one the PS2 uses. 
Various optimizations were done, including logic refactoring and rewriting the logic to infer a synchronous block RAM. Interestingly, you can see that the version 02 was the one with a synchronous block RAM, since the Cyclone 5 ended up using block RAMs instead of putting everything in registers. Note that the Arctic 7 isn't using block RAMs because it is using the lookup tables as a distributed RAM. We can see marginal improvements in the resource usage and the clock speeds of the optimized components. However, the optimization has become more apparent when looking at performing fine-tuning in the synthesizer. I added another column to the Arctic 7 category, which represents the best optimization frequency I could achieve using the fast model timing analysis. Unfortunately, the best I was able to achieve was 254 MHz for the O2 case, which even using the fastest speed grade device ends up being around 30 MHz short of the PS2's goal. Also note that timing represents the best case theoretical scenario, and the actual implementation will most likely need to be several megahertz slower. I applied the same optimizations to the OR gate type and was able to achieve a higher F max. There is also no frequency listed for the OR gate 32 entry case, since I didn't bother trying to optimize that case, given that the 48 entry case will set the lower frequency bound. Finally, there are a few things to note regarding these results. When looking at the timing analysis, the biggest timing offender ends up being the net delay, usually on the order of two times the logic delay. This means that effectively, the slower than expected times are as a result of the router meandering the net path and not a result of the logic description. It is possible that manually routing some of the nets could produce better timing results at the cost of highly specializing the implementation for a specific device. When compared to the OR gate implementation, the BRAM implementation provides significantly better resource usage and comparable speeds. Given that the resource usage is upwards of one-fifth, the best implementation solution is clearly the block RAM one. Unfortunately, this implementation results in a higher miss and probe cycle penalty, though both of those cases should happen infrequently enough that the resource trade-off is worth it. Almost all of the Arctic 7 implementations would be fast enough for the N64's TLB. While these results suggest that the N64's VR4300 could be overclocked above 100 MHz, we would be better off using an optimized design with an additional area constraint to take the smallest footprint possible on the FPGA, leaving more room for other components such as the rasterizer pipelines. And finally, none of the implementations here are fast enough for the PlayStation 2. The O2 optimization comes fairly close and may reach the PS2's clock frequency goal if manually routing is added. However, since we saw a speedup in the LU OR case, that led me to wonder if by minimizing and highly optimizing the control logic for the LU OR case with the J plus M implementation, we could potentially push the F max further. The first two lines are from the previous slide, which are here for comparison. The next thing I tried to implement, only a reduced logic hit tester, placing the majority of the TLB entries within a block RAM. This should reduce the number of registers needed for the entries and also put less strain on the control logic. This case is listed as the OR48B. The first thing we notice here is that we get a massive speedup when compared to the previous LU OR and the optimized case from the previous slide, reaching a maximum Fmax on the Arctic 7 of 304 MHz, which is 10 MHz faster than the PlayStation 2's R5900 processor. It should be noted, however, that this implementation is not the full TLB and will not provide the functionality needed by the processor. It did help tell me that I was going in the right direction, though. The next thing that I tried to do was implement the LU OR case using the Joint plus Micro TLB architecture. Effectively, this is the same architecture as the J plus M case previously mentioned, except instead of using block RAMs and an entry walker machine, it implements the hit testing entirely in parallel using masking and a large OR gate. This allows for a Micro TLB miss to only incur a three cycle penalty. We can see that in this case we are able to achieve a similar frequency to the base LU OR case, with the exception that this implementation provides the correct TLB functionality. Unfortunately, however, the maximum clock frequency of 286 MHz is still too slow for the PS2's R5900. It was then that I remembered an important implementation feature of the PS2's R5900. All of the previous implementations are using a fully selectable 32 and 64-bit TLB entry format. It was important to implement the full specification as that's what the N64's VR4300 CPU used. 
The PS2, however, did not implement the full 64-bit TLV entry format, and explicitly stated that the upper 32 bits of the virtual address are truncated during the virtual to physical address translation. This means that we could effectively remove a large portion of the logic responsible for the 64-bit translations. This was done by forcing the implementation of the 32-bit mode and hoping the synthesizer would prune away the unneeded logic. And this is what it came up with. The two additional rows here are for the joint OR gate implementation and the block RAM implementation, shown with an asterisk to denote that they are only 32-bit. Since the Cyclone 5's implementations were far below the Arctic 7 implementation's maximum clock frequency, I didn't bother trying to synthesize the implementation for that device, accepting the fact that it will not be possible to implement a PS2's R5900 processor on a Cyclone 5e, although the new Cyclone 10 might be an option considering that it is faster than the Cyclone 5. We can see that both the resource usage decreased and the clock frequencies increased, as is expected when logic is removed from the implementation. And you may notice that both the fast and optimized fast FMAX for the Arctic 7's OR gate TLB implementation is above the 295 MHz of the PS2's R5900. In addition to that, the FMAX is between 10 to 15 MHz faster than needed, which gives a bit of room for the frequency to drop due to combining with the rest of the system and routing delays, meaning that this implementation may allow for a final R5900 logic core to operate at or slightly above the 295 MHz needed by the PlayStation 2. So in conclusion, the Block RAM Joint TLB implementation would provide the required speed with a reduced resource usage for the N64, and the Orgate version set to 32-bit address mode provides the required speed for the PlayStation 2. Note that the choice for the N64 is also fast enough for the VR4300's 92MHz on the Cyclone 5, and therefore suggests that a Cyclone 5 implementation of the N64 will most likely be possible, assuming the final design fits within the device. A PlayStation 2 implementation would, however, require a faster device such as the Arctic 7 or potentially the Cyclone 10. As a final note, I want to mention that while Xilinx's Vivado IDE has a steeper learning curve and is not as intuitive to use as Altera's Quartus IDE, it does provide the user with significantly more optimization power, most of which was done post-fit and route. If anyone is interested, the optimization settings will be provided in the video description. Before ending the video, I want to leave you with a map of the VR4300's load store unit. This diagram shows all the relevant components required to execute all of the load store instructions in the VR4300. On the left side, we have the clocked registers with data from the previous pipeline stage. And on the right, we have registers required for the next pipeline stage. This means that all of the signals here must propagate from the left virtual address register to the right registers within a single cycle. This is the case for both loads and stores. Luckily, most of these components operate in parallel. However, the addition of more components does mean that the theoretical maximum frequency obtained so far are subject to being reduced due to other components in the unit. Note that the flags register on the right represents exception flags and stall flags, which are needed by the execution core to determine if the exception vector should be jumped to or if the pipeline should stall for a cache refill or bus read. Bus writes do not necessarily require a stall since there is a write back buffer within the bus interface. Additionally, note that the R5900's load store unit used in the PlayStation 2 is almost identical. With that said, we have already discussed the TLB system in this video, and the next video in this efficient design series will look at the load align unit. Most likely, I will not discuss the segmenter or the tag checker, since those are very simple units, most likely less than 10 lines of HDL code each. I will, however, discuss the cache and the bus interface in a future video. A final note, the construction load unit is very similar with a simplified load align unit since it only loads 32-bit words and no store path. Hopefully you found these two videos interesting even though they only briefly covered the entire design and implementation process. Thanks for watching.